thanks for thanks for for coming. This is the last day. Hopefully, we'll make it the best uh, of the days here by um, a, a useful dialogue. What I'd like to do here is take a look at the RGC, particularly the Quds Force, and push back a little bit on some of the statements coming out, both in Israel and in Washington. I mean, certainly in Washington, a number of senior officials have almost bragged about the impact of the sanctions, which have certainly had a notable effect on Iran's economy. I mean, if you look at the, the uh, IMF's predicted real GDP growth for 2019, it's negative 6%. Inflation, somewhere in the 30, 40 to 50% uh, realm, depending on which data you're looking at. Bloomberg had 50% uh, inflation uh, about a week ago. Uh, and obviously an impact on a whole range of, uh, of other factors, value of the real. Uh, but that has led Brian Hook, it's led uh, Secretary of State Pompeo to make arguments that the RGC Quds Force has been severely impacted by the um, uh, sanctions, uh, in part to, to give some sense of how U.S. sanctions have undermined, weakened the Iranian regime. So as part of an effort to look at this question, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time after looking at RGC Quds Force objectives, uh, putting this test to a little bit of data and, and looking at, at how and to what degree that's true. And as you'll find, I think that's, that picture is far too rosy. RGC is active in, in uh, fronts across the region. Uh, it may have been impacted to some degree with the amount of money it has access to to disperse, although that is subject to some debate. Uh, but I do not think the sanctions so far have significantly undermined RGC Quds Force activities. In fact, I think in many ways what they've done and what the tensions have done is increase the importance of the Quds Force as Iran's primary um, uh, primary uh, actor in the uh, in the region. So in terms of, of uh, objectives, uh, none of this is going to be new. I think everybody in this room is uh, well aware of RGC Quds Force. Uh, it still remains, I think, Iran's, along with a missile program, Iran's primary comparative advantage, uh, at least compared to other instruments of power. If you look at the state of Iran's uh, conventional forces, its ground forces, its Air Force and its naval forces, it's a relatively weak state. In some cases, it's used old American equipment from the Shah period in some of its battle tanks. So it's, it's a relatively weak conventional power. Its Quds Force continues to be involved in the collection and analysis of intelligence, uh, much like any country's special operations forces, of which I was uh, a part of in the US, the training, advising, and assisting of state and non-state partner forces, um, the conducting of assassinations and bombings, and obviously an important role in orchestrating cyber operations. But I think the question is, what indicators could we look at to give us a sense of whether the sanctions and other aspects have significantly degraded RGC Quds Force uh, capabilities and its ability to do a range of things? So one of the things he looked at is, uh, is the number of fighters. Obviously, this is not necessarily attached to outcomes in key areas. Uh, this, this is a data set we built that looks at um, partner forces of uh, IRGC Quds Force. And partner forces here, at least from my perspective, uh, indicates as opposed to proxies. Uh, I use that in part because the relationship between IRGC and Many of these forces varies considerably. Their organizational structures uh, vary considerably. How they're used varies considerably. So I think this is important in understanding um, the RGC's relationship. But we still pull them all together. This includes those partner forces from Lebanon, especially Hezbollah, uh, Syria, and we'll look at that in a little more detail, uh, the Hashid al-Shabi, or at least some of them in, in Iraq, uh, the Houthis operating in Yemen, some of the IRGC linked groups in Palestinian territory, and then some of the groups operating in countries like Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. 
one could have gone larger. We kept it contained to some of the main fronts. And as you'll see here, noted, at least according to our data, and this goes through the end of 2018, so what we've done is given you highs and lows here. Uh, according to our rough assessment, whether you're looking at highs or lows and assessing that the, the numbers are somewhere in the middle, we've seen a notable rise between 2013 and 2018, 40% increase in the number of uh, IRGC linked forces across those areas from Lebanon through Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Palestinian territory. I'm happy to go into the data uh, if you want, certainly later, but just suffice it to say at this point that we're seeing more fighters in more places uh, with training assistance uh, by the Quds Force. So hard for me to believe that the organization has been significantly weakened along these lines. Another area we've looked at is the pipelines that the Iranians using, the various fronts uh, across as they've They've operated not just in Lebanon, but increasingly in Syria, Iraq, and obviously Iran. I could have extended this into parts of Western and Central Afghanistan as well. But they have the ability, certainly unlike they did, let's say, 10 years ago, to move on the ground. So this is in addition to some of the air supply routes that they use. Uh, people, weapons, fighters and, and, and other uh, non-lethal equipment across a major front uh, in the northern central parts of this land bridge. The southern front, this caused some concern. Um, me and a number of others, I think in this room, did push back when the U.S. president uh, spoke publicly, tweeted publicly about pulling U.S. forces out of Syria. I sent a note to Brian Hook saying, hey, you guys do this. Uh, particularly pulling out forces from Al Tamf, which which is uh, as you can see just inside the Syrian border uh, near both Jordan and Iraq, uh, it would have I, I think unambiguously opened up the southern front of Iranian activity through Iraq and and into Lebanon. So some of the land bridge has been blunted by some sustained operations by U.S. and other forces uh, that continue to block that southern route. But I think the Iranian land bridge has, has been expanded, not uh, contracted over the last couple of years. Uh, the Iranians have also used considerable um, training facilities. I'm going to show you a couple of different ones. This is our satellite imagery. We've got a guy in, in Colorado, former NGA analyst. Uh, political military analyst uh, who's done our satellite imagery. It's, it's, a, it's incredible. Being in a government at one point, U.S. government at one point, uh, this would have been top secret compartmentalized, but now it's thanks to uh, the uh, uh, satellite companies that are public. You, anyone can get access to very sophisticated and in some cases uh, quite uh, interesting satellite imagery. So this is a Quds Force training facility near Tehran. The reason I show this is because what, what the Iranians have done uh, in areas where it, it may be a little delicate to uh, conduct training camps like this because of concerns about strikes. Uh, if you look at, we, we spent a lot of time looking at these size facilities in Yemen and they, they generally don't exist or we couldn't find them. What, we, what the Iranians have done is bring a number of fighters, especially leaders, into uh, Iran to conduct the training rather than setting up reasonably sized camps in a range of areas. But one of the things this is true, this is the Imam, Imam Ali training facility. You can see a range of the combat training facilities. You can see the um, housing and some of the headquarters of administration where they do some of their classroom exercises. The ba that base has expanded considerably over the last decade. And you'll see it with the one in Lebanon that I'll show you. Seeing expansion of training bases, I think this is another indicator. None of this is entirely scientific, but another indicator with the expansion of bases over time that they are probably more active than they've been in using it. If we looked at the RGC Quds Force back militias, among the more interesting one is, ones are what we're seeing in Syria. So if we look at the right map here, this is... Uh, uh, Itana, it's a, a non-governmental organization that has folks on the ground in a range of areas. What they've done is um, pull together information on Hezbollah and other Shia-linked groups in areas like 
southern Lebanon, not far from the Golan Heights. I was up along this Jordanian-Syrian border about a month ago to uh, talk to them and the Jordanians about some of these areas. And I will say, uh, almost every indicator down here in southwestern Syria is an expansion of Shia proxy groups operating in this region. Uh, numbers of uh, locations, and I think th th this is an area that, we're, that, that I'm looking at with some interest, although I don't, I don't have sufficient information to, to know for certain, maybe some of you in the room do, uh, but it looks like what, one of the things we're seeing is, I'm going to call it a Hezbollah, Hezbollahization of the ground in these, in these areas of southwestern Syria. Some Shia mosques that are starting to uh, pop up, uh, better integration of some of these fighters into the local landscape and potentially changing cultural situation on the ground. And if that's true, that would suggest that we're seeing much more entrenched, potentially long-term activity of Shia-linked groups. And, and obviously, as part of this, um, and this has been very, you know, relatively public in, in Israel, is the uh, strikes along these lines in uh, Syria. So we've put together a database of as many of the strikes as we could identify, including looking at the satellite imagery of the Israeli strikes against some of these locations in Syria. Uh, obviously, a lot of them are down in the southwest. Uh, we've obviously seen some strikes in other locations, including in Iraq, uh, so pretty extensive. I, I, I know these strikes have been uh, damaging to s some of the groups. My own view is that uh, both the Americans and the Israelis have been a little rose-tinted in assessing the effectiveness of these strikes. If it is true that we're seeing larger numbers of IRGC Quds Force linked groups, including in southern Syria, then there is a legitimate question about how much of the effectiveness of these strikes are tactical and how much of these are strategic and having a strategic impact. Um, they're not just targeting missiles and missile sites, but one of them we looked at here, another, this is our satellite imagery too. This is a UAV controlled vehicle linked to Iran. We, we, we could actually track the uh, aircraft that left Tehran, landed, parked on the runway here, offloaded a UAV uh, launch ramp in the control vehicle. And then I, I'm not showing you all the imagery that, that went into this, but as we're looking at this, the next day, the Israelis hit it. Uh, so we were all watching the same thing uh, with commercial and clearly uh, government uh, imagery and, and other sources of information. So uh, there is a sustained campaign. And again, one of the things that I would highlight as I go back to this map is how extensive we're seeing uh, IRGC-linked activity across Syria that's expanded over time. So I think as we look at the location of some of the IRGC-linked groups, including in Syria, I would argue we're seeing an expansion. So again, in some of these areas we've looked at, uh, numbers of fighters, land bridge, training facilities, uh, groups on the ground. I, I Hard for me to swallow that IRGC has been significantly weakened. In fact, I think one could make a, a case of quite the opposite. Um, I'm gonna move on to Hezbollah. And this is another training facility which has also expanded in size. This is just inside the Lebanese-Syrian border. Uh, we looked at a range of the different components of it from the firing ranges to the housing and storing units, the quarries which are used for improvised explosive devices, the um, headquarters networks. Again, uh, as we looked at this over time, some expansion in the size and it looks like the use of the facility by RGC-linked uh, groups, including the proximity of this location to Syria uh, suggested, a little hard for us to verify in open source information, that it was being used for the training of Syrian, uh, uh, Syrian groups as well. So not just Hezbollah, but Syrian-linked groups that would, could come across the border, especially because the Israelis were striking more targets on the Syrian side than the Lebanese side of the border. So bringing in for urban combat training and other activity. So again, lots of activity we're seeing along these lines. Um, I think if you look at, uh, 
At the Houthis, uh, we just looked at the threat of Saudi critical infrastructure to attacks. And one of the things we looked at here on the right side of the screen is the strikes by, um, by the Houthis using Iranian uh, technology and parts and general know-how against Saudi infrastructure. These are pipelines, uh, lots of Aramco activities. Haven't seen them strike some of the critical infrastructure like desal plants, although those would be really vulnerable, including ones around Riyadh. But as you'll see, a lot of the strikes uh, were in and around uh, Yemen, including a number of UAVs that have hit. And if you look at where the Houthis were just a couple of years ago, the, the capabilities they have on the missile front and the capabilities they have on armed UAVs, they use them for ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, and for strike. Uh, their capabilities, I think, have dramatically improved in ways that uh, I know in talking to senior Aramco officials in Saudi Arabia, they have become very concerned in part because of the disparity in resources. The Iranians have provided you know, limited amounts of funding and technology. And look how the Saudis just struck, I think it was last week, a couple of the UAVs that were coming across the uh, Yemeni-Saudi border. They're using fixed-wing aircraft uh, I mean, a, and, and, and shooting them down with missiles. I mean, multi-million dollar aircraft with missiles against very crude UAVs. If you're the Iranians, the, you know, and that, not that the Saudis have a lack of money, but um, but it's a disparity in in resources for small amounts of money. They're getting the Saudis uh, to uh, use significant amounts of uh, funding, defensive measures. They're using offensive cyber operations against these facilities uh, uh, as well. So a huge disparity along those lines, um, and. The critical infrastructure, this is Abqaiq in, in Saudi Arabia, which has come under notable threat. Uh, it's a processing and, and stabilization plant. This is our imagery from uh, June 5th, uh, 2019. Lo uh, notable threats from RGC Quds Force linked Houthis here, in part because of what not just the Iranians, but also Hezbollah has provided in Yemen. So uh, I think one could broaden this activity also to looking at the uh, operations of the Fatimayun from Afghanistan, the Zenabayun from Pakistan, and then uh, other IRGC-linked groups, including in, um, uh, in Bahrain. So as I take a step back, again, let me just say that I, 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 I wish I was up here to say that the sanctions and some of the steps taken against the IRGC have been effective, and they may have to some degree, although it's hard to verify, at least for me through open source information, uh, hard to verify how much funding has been uh, impacted by the sanctions. But what I'll say is that all the, virtually all the evidence I'm looking at suggests that IRGC Quds Force is very active, more active than it's been today than it was five years ago in more areas, and its partners, many of its partners are uh, better equipped, have better technology, and and are and continue to pre present a threat to the Israelis, the Americans, the Saudis, and others across this region. Now, um, there's a good news story here. It's not entirely dire, and that is, um, I think the the Iran's economy remains fragile, and to the degree that that continues, I think it does impact all aspects of Iran, including potentially the Quds Force, though. Uh, the, the fact that we see Qasem Soleimani so closely linked, including in photographs to the Supreme Leader, indicates, I think, that if things really become bad for the Iranians, hard to see the RGC based on its comparative advantage among other Iranian military actors, hard to see the, the uh, regime willing to starve the IRGC of adequate resources. But as, those, as the levels of available funding come down uh, and potentially IRGC uh, and Hezbollah activities, including the drug trade in Lebanon, start to decline, uh, it may impact funding more broadly. I mean, there also have been some interesting comments uh, that have come out of public opinion polls and uh, newspapers, including in Syria and Lebanon, 
The uh, Hezbollah's role has been subject to some controversy in Lebanon. There have been questions about, is it worth the blood costs uh, when Lebanon is the primary theater to see soldiers dying in, in Syria? Those numbers are likely to come down. This may be a moot issue sooner rather than later because the war is largely over other than in Idlib. I mean, the Russians, the Iranians, and, uh, and the Syrian regime is, is, as unfortunate as for me to say this, have won. You know, they control almost all the major urban areas now. Uh, the, uh, the Idlib area is really the last remaining rebel area. Obviously, there are, there are areas up in the north where the Turks control their uh, SDF and other Kurdish forces that control areas of the east. Uh, but the major city, most of the major cities are now under regime or, or regime allied control. Um, still, there's also massive variation, and there are people in this room uh, who know this better than I, including Ben Conable, uh, but there is wide variation even among Iraq's view, including among the Shia militia of, of Iran. So by no means am I suggesting that RGC, RGC could force linked groups in Iraq are monolithic, uh, or even the Shia militias in Iraq are monolithic. There, there are substantial divisions among them, which uh, we don't have time here to talk through. But, but obviously, those those present vulnerabilities and weaknesses that can be exploited. And then finally, when one looks at poll, polling data, even stuff that's come out of Pew Research, I mean. Almost every country, when asked about Iranian views, and note, by the way, that the U.S. is now uh, along the, in the, some of the same categories, uh, is among the most unpopular governments in the Middle East. So uh, it, it, I'm not sure that's something to be proud of, but, uh, but it, it, Iran still remains deeply unpopular. Their activism across this region is not winning them a lot of local friends among the broader population. So... Uh, and that's certainly true when you extend, extend that polling outside of the Middle East and in North Africa. Views of Iran have declined or they've remained low, in, including in, uh, in populations in North America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, and that includes some, a number of Muslim-majority countries like Malaysia and, and Indonesia. So as I, as I just wrap up here, again, the, the bottom line that I have is that the, the sanctions in particular, which is what US officials have been talking publicly about, have had an impact on the economy. But at least according to some of the analysis we've done, RG could, uh, RGC Kuds Force uh, remains the primary po foreign policy actor. Obviously, the, the missile program is important of Iran. And it continues to be very active in extending Iran's influence in a number of countries and improving the capabilities of groups on the ground. So my message to you is not a particularly optimistic one. Uh, it's one that shows pretty deep-seated concern for what, uh, what Iran is doing in, in, in the region. Thank you.